Okay, hello everyone. Hi out there. <laughs> Hi everyone. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. We still have a number of people logging in. We had uh, around 250 people register, so we are expecting some more. I'm going to start with some of the, the beginning pieces and, and when we get into the meat of the topic, hopefully we'll have a few more people here. So hi everyone, my name is Jody Ron, and I'm the Managing Director of the Civic Action Leadership Foundation. And on behalf of Civic Action and the Emerging Leaders Network, I am thrilled to um, have all of you as part of this conversation today. Despite the fact that I have probably likely aged out of the title Emerging, um, I, I think this is an incredibly important conversation and I'm really happy to be able to play a role here tonight. Um, Essentially, my role will be as moderator, so I'll try to keep things on time and keep things moving. I've started two minutes late, so I'm already failing miserably. Um, we are also being supported tonight by an awesome team of colleagues at Civic Action, so my thanks in advance to them for making this happen so quickly this week. Uh, whether we're meeting physically or virtually, it's important to acknowledge the land that we're gathered on. So I want to start by acknowledging that the land Civic Action works on, the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area, remains the traditional and current Indigenous territories that include the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabeg, the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Mississaugas of the Scugog Island First Nation. And we also acknowledge that some of you participating today may be on different land, and we invite you to share your own land acknowledgement in the chat feature. Today, the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area remains home to many Indigenous uh, people across Turtle Island, with Toronto making up the largest urban Indigenous population in the country. And as we think about the impacts of COVID-19 across all of our communities in various ways, it's important to remember that the historical oppression and inequalities that Indigenous people have faced are often exacerbated during crises like the one that we are here to discuss tonight. And in our Indigenous communities are often disproportionately impacted by events like, uh, by, like COVID-19 as they, in face, uh, they face increased economic inequality, reduced access to health care and public health resources, among other challenges. So one of the calls to action for each person here tonight, myself included, is to think about how we are educating ourselves about how COVID-19 is impacting our Indigenous people, their communities and their livelihood. A few housekeeping items before we get started. Today's agenda will focus very much on the topic of COVID-19 and I know that it is forefront in everyone's mind and it's, it's important that it is, but specifically on the role that it's impacting rising leaders in the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area and specifically here in the city. You'll hear from senior leaders like our mayor, but you'll also hear from a number of members of our Emerging Leaders Network who bring different views and different perspectives and different lived experiences to this topic. The session is intended to be fully interactive. So throughout the session, we'll be seeking your feedback in the chat and in the Q&A box. You will also see polls pop up intermittently. So please do participate in those. A couple of Zoom tips for those of you out in the Zoomosphere. I feel like I'm starting completely new lingo. Uh, to the, the AE learners who are going to join us as panelists tonight, uh, we will control all of the sound, so do not worry about clicking mute or activating your cameras. We will look after that. Uh, we encourage everyone who's joining us tonight to please use the, the functions to engage and ask questions. If you have questions, please use the Q&A box. I think you can find it at the bottom of your screen. What's really great about the Q&A box is that, um, is that you can upvote other people's comments. So if there's something there that somebody has posted that you agree strongly with, uh, like it. So we can curate those and, and pull those out and make sure that they get asked later in the, in the session. The chat function is, mean, is used largely for just general comments. So this is an amazing network. We encourage you to chat amongst each other and react to what you're hearing. And if you have any technology issues, I also encourage you strongly to put those into the chat function and someone will, uh, will manage that for us. Lastly, I just want to say this is the very, very first time that we have ever done any kind of digital gathering like this, uh, of this size. So we are going to, in advance, ask for your forgiveness and patience in case we experience any technical issues. We have been through this multiple times in advance. We've done lots of dry runs, but so fingers and toes crossed that everything works for us tonight. So let's get started. To outline tonight's session and to introduce the mayor and a few of our special guests, please welcome the interim CEO of Civic Action, Tamada Balan. 
Thank you and hello to everyone. It really is a pleasure to be here with you to kick off this very important conversation. It's amazing to see so many rising leaders show up and join us tonight. A very special welcome to a couple of others who might have aged out of emerging, um, to our chair of the Civic Action Board, Zabin Hirji, and Civic Action Leadership Foundation Board Chair, Tim Hockey. We also have several members of our board with us to listen, to learn, to help navigate and coordinate the actions we'll need to take as a region to collectively respond, recover, and rebuild from the new and emerging COVID realities. So much work is underway already. But when terms like so self-isolation and social distancing enter our collective lexicon, and every day seems to bring new set of rules to live by, we know it's time to double down our efforts in building ties that bind and not let people drift apart or fall through the cracks. At the core of tonight's conversation are two things, connection and community both critical to weathering the shocks a crisis like COVID has dealt us, and equally important to laying the foundation for building the next, a post-COVID version of the Toronto region. Over the past week, we've asked rising leaders how they're doing. We know that many are feeling the very sudden and deep impacts on all aspects of their lives. Concerns about the health and well-being of family and friends, about job security, about making rent, about keeping the lights on in their businesses, about the need to show up to work during this pandemic, or the challenges of working remotely are just to name a few. I don't need to tell you that the challenges we face today are difficult, unsettling, and complex. We've heard you loud and clear. Over our 20 year history at Civic Action, we've focused our attention on some of the toughest issues our region faces. Mental health and well-being, the roots of youth violence, Recovering from the SARS epidemic are just a few examples. But we've also focused on building the region's bench strength, a network of emerging leaders, which today includes you and 2,500 others. Tonight's Digital Dish conversation is our first, and we'll start with one of the founders of Civic Action, the mayor of the city of Toronto, Mayor John Tory. Mayor Tory will help make sense of COVID-19, how it's affecting our city, and the steps being taken to support residents businesses and organizations. And then we wanna hear from you about the additional supports that may be required for rising leaders. And what will recovery take? And finally, the mayor will do a live Q&A. I wanna thank Mayor Tory for not only being part of this conversation tonight, but for the tireless work you, your colleagues and the city staff are doing to manage the effects of COVID and to prepare for the recovery. With that, I wanna invite Mayor Tory to share some opening remarks Mr. Mayor, the virtual podium is yours. Uh, Tamara, thank you very much. And uh, I can't tell you how happy I am to be uh, doing this. I did, it, I did one last night, for example, with the Muslim community, tomorrow night with some people in the Tamil community and one of our members of parliament. But it's a great way for me. Uh, I, I, I very much benefit from uh, being out in the community and attend lots of different events and to be denied that opportunity just by circumstances that we're in now uh, has made it uh, uncharted territory for me as well. So these uh, these virtual town halls to give me a chance, digital dish as it were, to uh, stay in touch with people and to hear from you. I want to just I want to just talk for a minute. Uh, it's also a pleasure for me because I am, as uh, Kamado said, one of the founders of Civic Action. And it's interesting because Civic Action, the real founder was David Pico, and there were a few of us who kind of tagged along in his wake and tried to help him get it going. But um, we did, and we did it in the wake of, or at the time of, uh, one of the last uh, episodes of this kind that we faced as a city, we've had traumatic incidents that have happened like the van attack and they were you know, very different, the Young Street van attack. But we had in 2003, uh, the SARS epidemic, of course, and also a tremendous power blackout. And the SARS epidemic uh, really was a small taste of what we're experiencing here. There was terrible loss of life, uh, 44 people, which for us was you know, really something that was almost unheard of. Uh, but also huge dislocation to the economy because a lot of businesses were forced to close or, you know, were put into dire straits because people just stopped coming to the city because they were told around the world that there was a lot of bad things going on here health-wise. Uh, what we're facing today is different uh, because it's a worldwide, a global pandemic, and we're seeing, of course, lots of other cities affected the same way. And really what I want to do tonight is to give you a very short update and then hear from you because um, it's only by hearing from you that I can sort of determine what, where there are gaps and things that we're trying to do as a leadership group that are responsible for uh, managing us through this crisis and coming out the, end, uh, the other end stronger and, and better than ever. 
um, you know, trying to save lives, which is the number one thing we're doing. I mean, what we're trying to do is fundamentally, we you keep reminding yourself, you know, if you have three priorities, uh, you know, if you have any more than that, you may not have any, but we're trying to save lives first and foremost. We're trying to protect health and the healthcare system. Secondly, because of course, if we get too many people sick, uh, we're going to overwhelm the healthcare system and that will be uh, very dangerous for the people who are sick with, uh, with the uh, virus, but also for anybody else who's sick from any, any other purpose. And then third, and no less important, we're trying to make sure that we protect the economy and, the, the, and our way of life so that those things are not irretrievably damaged by what's gone on. I am uh, wanting to just really join Tamara in saying, how much uh, admiration I have, how much gratitude I have for the frontline workers. A lot of them are city workers, but not all by any means. We have a lot of people who work for the city who are uh, firefighters and ambulance drivers and public health workers, first and foremost, public health workers and um, a, a host of other groups, police officers, shelter employees, and so on. Then we have a whole lot of people who work in the broader public sector that are working for us, of course, in the hospitals and uh, other places related to the healthcare system. And then we have a whole host of other people uh, who are working in jobs that I think it's, it's great. It's a great thing that we've come to see, for example, people who work in grocery stores as being frontline workers. Because, you know, when you think about it for a minute, not just during the COVID-19 crisis, but all the time, if we didn't have people that worked in food stores and didn't have farmers that grew food and so on, we'd be in a lot of trouble. And so today they're being recognized for what they are, which is people that are, uh, you know, absolutely essential in our uh, the challenge of making sure that we can continue to live our lives or at least a semblance of our lives during the crisis. So I want to say that I'm grateful to them. I want to say as well that it's very hard for me. I mean, I have a, I have had a privileged life and I have one today to fully understand uh, what is going on with people. For example, say a couple live in an apartment. They're both working and trying to work from home. Uh, they have two kids. Uh, they're not really allowed to go out because we've told them they shouldn't. The kids aren't in school. The people are trying to do their work from home. Um, and, and they're being told they really shouldn't go anywhere else except in their apartment, not even to the park if it can be, uh, if it can be avoided going to the park. They're to go shopping once a week where they may have habits that are much uh, uh, different than that. And then, of course, it can get even worse than that. That's a sort of a, a difficult set of circumstances. Uh, worse than that can be the fate that some of you may have suffered. I hope not, but uh, many people have that are your friends and my friends where they lost their jobs entirely. Sometimes in a couple, both people will have lost their jobs. The kids aren't in school. They live in a modest sized apartment. They're told they can't go out. They're told they can't go to the park. They're worried about, about their financial security. They're worried about their health. A lot of people are very worried about their health as well they should be. And you'll hear some of the projections tomorrow. And as the premier correctly said today, they're stark. They're very stark and they're not stark with a view to trying to scare anybody. They're stark within the context of stuff you've seen on television. You know, namely that if you look at New York City, one hour's plane right away, many of you will have been there, I'm sure, on business or as tourists. And they went in the last three weeks from having zero people dead to today, I think, about 1,600. And there's no end in sight there. What we've tried to do is focus on making sure the city can serve people with the very basic services we have to maintain, whether it's water or police or any of those kinds of things. We've paid a particular attention. No issue has had more attention than the plight of vulnerable populations. And that includes uh, homeless people. It includes people with special challenges facing them, whether it be mentally ill or people with addiction issues or those kinds of things. It includes all people over 70 because they are a particularly medically vulnerable group uh, when it comes to this virus. Uh, and that includes, of course, a subset of those people, 70 and over, who live uh, in long-term care or other kinds of seniors, residences, or, uh, or, long, or um, retirement residences, because, of course, when you get a whole group of those people all together, um, it is going to pose an even bigger challenge in terms of just the physical environment that they're in and the proximity with which they live uh, with one another. So we're having to deal with all that, and we're having to deal with uh, working with the other governments to make sure there are plans and programs in place. And I, I will say for me, I feel heartened by the fact that the initial steps taken by the other governments have been helpful. They've focused on the fact that people and businesses are both uh, suffering from liquidity issues. They're, they need cash in their pocket. Uh, they have uh, big challenges in terms of paying the rent. We've been working as advocates to landlords to say, look, they should be trying to be um, pragmatic with people about making arrangements. We've made arrangements ourselves to be pragmatic with all the people who send us money by deferring payments and that kind of thing so that we can leave some money in the pockets of people, first and foremost, and uh, especially smaller businesses so they can make sure to survive uh, to live another day. And uh, there have been various measures brought forward by the federal government in particular, and to some extent by the provincial government to, in the case of the province, uh, stop evictions during the time of the crisis. In the case of the federal government, actually supplement 
uh, people's uh, put some money in people's pockets and, and uh, subsidize wages for a period of time. But we don't pretend by any means. We've got tables set up that involve citizens. It's a real it's a kind of civic action type a project where we have 14 tables. The city's divided into 14 uh, zones to try and make sure, for example, that we can get food to the elderly. It's fine for us to tell elderly people over 70 that they can't go out and they can't go to the store and they shouldn't ever go out of their apartments or their homes. But then you have to say, well, all right, well, who's going to get them their food? And if they don't have any family or other people that support them, we have to do it for them. These are people who might have been perfectly able to go out were it not for the fact that we told them not to. So there's a lot of challenges like that in front of us. There's the challenge of providing proper public transportation, but at the same time, the current arrangements have us losing $20 million a week in a fair revenue. And you know that in, when it comes to local government, we're not allowed to run a deficit. So if we lose $20 million a week on the TTC uh, through fair revenue, then somehow in order to keep our books balanced, we have to make that up. And there's only two ways to make it up, raising taxes, which doesn't seem to be a very good idea just now, or cutting services, which is also not a good idea just now. So I'll stop there and just say you can start to get an idea of the balancing act we have to do. Even the bylaw that I signed today under the emergency powers that are given to me, which said people have to stay two meters away from each other, you sort of say to yourself, well, that seems like a bit of an intrusion into people's civil liberties. And I agree. I had to sit in my office and make that decision. I was asked on Metro Morning this morning, well, did I realize all the... I don't think she said damage, but the woman said to me, did I realize all the havoc that it was causing the economy, all these decisions I was partaking in to have more businesses closed down? And I said, well, of course, um, you know, I'm a human being and we're forced to make these decisions by virtue of the offices we hold. And we know that every decision we make to stop the spread of the virus, which is rampant in its own way or can be rampant, is a decision that has an impact on somebody in some way or other and affects somebody's life in a way that's not positive. So my objective right now is to get people to follow the advice which we're getting from our professional health advisor, the medical officer of health. She's an excellent, competent, capable, professional person. And if we do that, uh, we uh, can guarantee ourselves of one thing, which is this thing will, uh, will cause less loss of life. It will cause less damage to the healthcare system and it will be over sooner. So we can all get back to our lives in a way that is normal and that we treasure with all the events we've had to cancel and all those things. So I'm looking forward to just sitting back now and hearing from you. I think there's going to be a period of the meeting where I listen and don't answer questions. And then there'll be a period where I answer your questions, which I'm very pleased to do. But again, thank you to Civic Action. Thank, thank you to the Foundation. Thank you to the Emerging Leaders uh, Network for uh, allowing me this opportunity to listen to you and to dialogue with you. This is a very important discussion. It's sometimes difficult for me to have access to people like this uh, in my day-to-day -day work, especially during a crisis. So over to you, Tamara, thank you again. Thank you, Mayor Tori, it's Jody here. So the way the next portion of this, uh, this evening will go is we've lined up a number of, of rising leaders who are going to share some thoughts on how COVID-19 has impacted them and their community. So one of the things that Mayor Tory told us when we were planning this conversation was that he wanted to hear from a diverse range of rising leaders and we there is no better place to do that than through civic action and through the ELN. Um, when you registered, we all asked you to share your ideas on how the city can support you today and as we move down the road into a period of recovery, both economic and social. Our team is going to package up every little piece of information and, and, and insight that you shared with us and make sure that that gets to Mayor Tory's office. But tonight, we do have a lineup of speakers that are willing to share their ideas in person. So we are going to cycle through those people. And then at the end, Mayor Tori, there will be time for you to, to share any thoughts that you have. Again, the question was, how can the city best support rising leaders today? And how can the city best support rising leaders in the weeks to come when we think about economic and social recovery? So we are going to give each of our rising leaders that we've lined up a chance to share their thoughts. Once we get through everyone, Mayor Tori will provide feedback. So uh, everyone who is, um, is speaking, if I could ask you to introduce yourself, tell us what your organizational affiliation is, what part of the city you live in, and then your thoughts. We are going to start with Linksy. Hi folks, um, Lindsay here. Um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to convene with so many people and um, the opportunity to share some insights. I work with a social enterprise based here in Toronto called Youthful Cities. We work with people 18 to 35 um, through research as well as through activation programming on ways of how they can help make their cities better places to live, play and work. Uh, being uh, like working in it for a small business um, and also being a youth, um, I felt the impact of the last few weeks in several different ways and in ways. Um, and we personally at our organization have tried really hard to uh, 
engage as much as we can virtually with the youth that we work with in the GTA and across the country and to gather insights of how they've been feeling, how they've been impacted and what they, they need during these times. Um, something that has resonated a lot with us in the past months, um, even in the past few days, is the, the narrative around how youth are behaving and engaging with pandemic guidelines. So it seems that a lot of the, the, the narrative, not just in Toronto, but just in, in the, the popular media sources, has been that youth haven't really been listening um, to the social distancing guidelines. And we've seen a lot of articles come out about young people partying and young people meeting for picnics, et cetera. And while that is definitely true, what we've noticed through our work is that there's actually hundreds of people showing up for our Zoom calls who are at home alone, socially distancing and trying to figure this all out. Um, there's people that are going on to other web apps to have a drink virtually with their friends instead of meeting at the park or at their friend's house. And what we've noticed is that the sentiment of being felt, uh, feeling left out and also um, just I, villainized is, is a bit of a harsh word, um, I think, but there's definitely a sentiment of we wish that the narrative was a little bit more positive, um, especially because young people are also being relied on, it seems simultaneously, to lead that digital revolution for everybody else. Um, we've heard from so many folks that they get constant messages and calls of how do I use Zoom? What's the difference between a hangout and a Zoom and a house party? Like folks just don't know and they're reaching out to to us to help them figure out, which, it, which is great and we're, we're here to support. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to share, what we've been experiencing in beautiful cities and also personally amongst my, my networks, is um, lots of small businesses are trying to hire youth as much as possible. I know we're doing it, but I also know a lot of our colleagues and partner organizations are trying to do it as well. Um, like, like Mayor Tory mentioned earlier, a lot of young people have lost their, their jobs and we're trying to create those virtual positions as much as we can but in the next coming weeks i thought about this a lot and i think what what would be fantastic is some sort of support for small businesses or subsidies i i'm i'm not sure exactly the format that it would come in to help hire young people there's some organizations starting to do that on the ground right now and it's really helpful but even to have a website that convenes all those resources for small businesses like ours to help us hire those folks that have lost their jobs because we know it and the research has shown and we know it personally as well that those dollars invested in young people will come back um, to fruition so that's that's a few of my thoughts. And again, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share. Thank you, Lindsay. If you see me disappear from the picture for one second, I'm going to get a pen. Because okay. I have to write this down or I'm going to distract. <laughs> but I'm listening. I can still oh. hear you, but I just want to get a pen. Okay, good, because you have the answers. <laughs> well, uh, I hope thank so. you. Thank you, Lindsay. I'm sorry I pronounced your name wrong. Uh, next, we have Danielle. So, Danielle, if you want to get queued up and we'll wait till Mayor Tori comes back from finding a pen. Hold on. I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm coming. <laughs> I think he can hear you. So maybe get started. There go we ahead. Go. Okay. And right. Keep it to two minutes if you can. Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, Mayor Tori. Um, my name is Daniela. I'm a health policy analyst working for a healthcare nonprofit and living in North York. I'm very privileged that during COVID-19, I've been able to continue working from home where I live with my family, but this isn't the case for many in the city today. It's now April 2nd and no level of government has put into place a rent freeze, leaving many in precarious housing situations and at risk of eviction. In the immediate term, calling for a rent freeze would help keep people in their homes and allow them to stay safe and healthy and practice social distancing without the fear of losing housing. This is a public health issue and the situation has been exacerbated due to the ongoing affordable housing crisis in the city. When we look forward to the economic and social recovery of the city post COVID-19, one of the main things we need is to ensure that the people who do make change in our cities, including young people and families and marginalized populations, need to be able to live, work and invest in our communities over the long term. This isn't possible for a large majority of rising leaders in the city due to how expensive it is to rent, buy and live in Toronto right now. If we want Toronto to recover, we're going to need to seriously invest in ensuring everyone in the city is able to access safe and affordable housing, both right now during the COVID-19 crisis and as well as in the long term. Thank you, Daniela. 
Uh, thank you. We're, we're going to move on to Oase, Oase Light Walla. And then next will be Durka. Hello. Uh, thank you so much for having me, uh, Civic Action, and for convening, and for Mayor Tori for making the time. I cannot imagine what your life is like uh, right now and how many different things you're juggling. And the fact that you're making the space to hear us all out, I really appreciate uh, uh, you being here. Uh, I'm Awais uh, uh, Lightwala. I'm the managing director of Why Not Theatre. Uh, Why Not is a independent uh, theatre company that uh, is based in Toronto, but with an international scope, we like to say. Uh, we were, until 15 minutes ago, one of Canada's fastest growing companies. Uh, I think I'm going to have to find a new way to describe us now because uh, of a whole bunch of changes that have come in our sector. Uh, Projects are being canceled left, right, and center um, in the short term and in the long term. The domino effects of uh, the postponements, of the cancellations, of the uh, real havoc that's being uh, wrecked in the industry in terms of artists who are out of work, in terms of organizations who don't have the, the finances and the capacity to really make it out of a six-month slump. Uh, we're only starting to feel the full uh, brunt of that. And uh, in this moment, I think, you know, for the uh, art sector, and at least for, for myself as a leader in that community, I really feel like we're all kind of collectively trying to brace ourselves and do our best to do our part and, and pause our activities, recognizing that the real important work right now is saving lives, is staying home, is, is uh, helping ensure that we protect the vulnerable. Um, and uh, and I and I think in this in this short term um, we are all really uh, trying to make the sacrifices we can to uh, allow for that work to happen. In the longer term, uh, I, I have so many thoughts and questions about you know what the opportunity is in this crisis. And uh, one of the things that you know we were uh, all very concerned with before this moment was uh, who are we building Toronto for? And and the increasing gap between the have and the have nots and the increasing inequality. Um, and if we have a moment to really restructure, to really think about what we're building, when we talk about recovery, what are we recovering to? And what does the new world order look like? Um, and, and what role can artists play in that? Because I think one of the things that uh, we're really finding about our community is there's a real passion to be part of the recovery effort, to unify folks, to bring people to, that's all we do. We bring people together to share experiences. And it's something that we want to be part of and want to do. And, and how can we be uh, contributing that energy in the in the mid and the long term going forward, uh, because it feels like, like right now that uh, the kind of access to even have your voice heard, to even be part of that movement of uh, helping shape the 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 process and the future is something that is not uh, open to everybody. And uh, as someone who represents communities that are often not uh, in the mainstream, that are that are the rising leaders and not the leaders, um, is there opportunities for more meanings like this actually? Like the fact that Civic Action has even taken this uh, uh, initiative is I think, I think the direction that I would love to see more movement towards so that we can build something new together. Thank you. Thank you, Oase. Uh, next, Durka, and then Edwin, you'll be up next after that. Durka, over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you again, um, Civic Action and Mayor Tori, for the opportunity to be able to uh, join this discussion um, and other rising leaders across um, across the region. Um, so I'm a program manager who's worked uh, predominantly in the nonprofit sector, um, as well as within government over the last little while. Um, and as, as many of you wear a number of different hats, uh, most res recently, I've also been uh, affected by uh, layoffs um, across the region, uh, juggling also life as a new mom, as a millennial. Millennial, um, and as a uh, as a Tamil uh, Canadian as well, and so I think um, it, it's interesting to, to to juggle many of the different um, real life experiences that others are facing across the city as well. And I think that um, as an overlay, clearly we're in unprecedented times, and as a result, I think the the, the te what teamwork um, and what problem solving means in this in this sort of unchartered territory is going to be something different as well. Um, and I think as a um, one of the biggest sort of issues that's um, overhanging all um, many others um, sort of in a similar profile as um is sort of the future of work. One of which is the future of work. Um, and I think we all understand that building resilient communities um, going forward is going to require a dynamic workforce. And amongst this crisis, um, as we continue, what does the future of work really look like? Um, and helping us navigate these unchartered uh, ter territories um, is something that um, 
really resonates and, and it is something that we're all individually exploring. Of course, in the immediacy, immediacy of what's going on right now, um, the, the best that we, the, what we can do, as, as you've alluded to earlier, is, um, is saving lives and, and self-isolation isolation um, amongst us, but in terms of the longer term, what does this look like? Um, and how is the city see uh, rising leaders um, in, in this? Um, particularly my, to my second point, um, I think there's a strong thirst for rising leaders to engage themselves as problem solvers. I mean, it's clearly evident the um, amount of challenges that we're facing now. And I think what we're yearning for as well is there new, are there new pathways for us to engage as problem solvers um, and engage with the city in, in trying to solve these problems. And, and as part of that, um, I've led a program before where um, uh, provincial governments um, share sort of problem statements with uh, businesses and, and young people to engage their ideas on how they can solve these issues. And we're, in the longer term, is there an opportunity for um, rising leaders to engage more closely with some of the, the issues that you're seeing um, day to day? Because I think there is a strong thirst for um, engaging in what solutions will look like going forward. Um, because of course, um, what this is going to look like is is unprecedented and not something that the solutions are going to be ones that um, are ones that we may not have that will require rather um, a multi-sector and multi um, appro uh, approach um, as well as um, sort of inspired a new thinking uh, and a new way of working all together. Thank you. Thank you, Durga. Uh, Edwin, we'll bring Edwin's camera up. Edwin, you're next and then Christine, you're on deck. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. I think uh, in light of this being a civic dish, I did bring some food, but uh, it looks like nobody else is eating, so maybe I won't, uh, I won't have this right now. Uh, my name is Edwin Weichikon, and I work with the Ontario Public Service with the Employment and Training Division. Um, and I'm also part of the Emerging Leaders Network, which is a really great opportunity for me to meet other young people who really care about these issues. Um, I come from Ward 7, Humber River, Black Creek, and that's the neighborhood I grew up in, that's the neighborhood I like to visit, I go every week, um, and that's where I have my roots. In regards to the first question that was asked, I think um, people are feeling disconnected. I think a lot of people I've talked to are feeling like they are lacking community. They can't go out, they can't see their friends, they can't see their family, and it's, it's being really hard on them. And I think, I think the city is in a great position to lead or at least invest in programming around digital community engagement. Um, people are starting to feel anxious on one end and on the other end, people are feeling bored. Like I don't, for me, I'm getting tired of the Instagram challenge. Like I can't do the push-up challenge anymore. It's too much for me. Um, but I think young people are considered digital natives. And I think the city should leverage that in trying to get, um, more community, building more community engagement virtually, or at the very least, like maybe getting direct feedback on um, social and economic um, development projects. I think young people are open to that and would be more than capable of handling that responsibility, especially in a time like this. Um, in regards to the second question, I think the two things that come to mind about what the city can do longer term about the economic and social um, issues we're going to be having. I think mentorship and jobs, to echo what people have already said, are, are really key ones, right? Um, I know in my neighborhood, people from all sorts of different industries are being laid off. And, and there is going to be a recession like a lot of people are talking about. I think a mentorship program to help mentor these people that may have been laid off or are trying to get into the workforce will, will really go a long way. Um, in addition to that, I think um, supporting jobs and supporting businesses that hire young people would be a great initiative that the city can take on. Um, yeah. Thank you, Edwin. And thank you for uh, bringing food. <laughs> <laughs> you, you embraced embrace digital dish. Awesome. Thank you. We're going to move to Christine uh, and then Howard and then Amanda is our last speaker. Christine. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Jody and Tamara, for having me, and thank you, Mayor Tori, for spending the time with us listening to us. Um, I have a background in the non-for-profit non arts. Um, I've worked at many arts organizations within the city. Um, I recently made the jump from non-profit to for-profit. Uh, I was employed by Circus Soleil, 
uh, and I'm part of the 95% uh, of the layoff that happened uh, recently. Uh, so not feeling too good about that jump, but uh, it was uh, worth it for the time that happened. Um, uh, first, I want to acknowledge that I'm in a very uh, privileged position where I can think long term instead of where my next paycheck is coming from or um, you know, how I'm going to pay rent, which is uh, something I need to say. Uh, so there's going to be uh, a very, I think, slow recovery period for uh, those of us who uh, work in arts and entertainment. I think people are going to be very hesitant to be in crowds uh, um, and among uh, just different people on outside. I think it's going to take a while for people to um, reset and readjust um, and be comfortable around people and crowds. Uh, so many of us are thinking about switching industries, um, but might not have the actual experience within that industry. So um, my statement or question uh, basically repeats the many questions and many um, asks about support or apprenticeship programs or funding um, or mentorship for people that are eager to get back into the workforce um, and are eager to lend their skills to various organizations who maybe are combating the millions of problems that are kind of come from um, this COVID-19 situation. So uh, that's my statement. Uh, I also have a very quick question that maybe I can get you to think about right now. Uh, Toronto is very resilient. We've come through something like this before, uh, albeit very small. Um, what is the long-term lasting positive change that you're hoping the city can under undergo from this very tragic situation? Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Uh, so Howard and then Amanda, and then we're gonna turn things back to Mertori for some reaction. Hello, hi. Uh, I'm just going to turn on my video. Hi. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, working. Hi, uh, I'm Howard, uh, and uh, I, I do um, urban planning and actually strategic planning work, and I'm a consultant, uh, so I run a small business by myself. Um, and so, I mean, a good chunk of my business has dried up, uh, but at the same time, um, I have been able to uh, I've been, I'm in a privileged position enough, I think, to be able to think about some of these things long term. Um, and uh, so I've, uh, you know, starting to pivot into different alternative sort of um, uh, methods of, uh, of delivering the same services that I've, I've been offering. So, uh, so a lot of my, I guess, observations and questions are coming more from a kind of an observational perspective, uh, just around, I would say, um, how do we actually, uh, like, so, I guess I look at this from sort of like um, kind of a systemic perspective, which is that um, as we go through this, we're going to be going through this period of this sort of shutdown, uh, followed by recovery, followed by hopefully uh, some level, some uh, amount of, um, uh, I guess, like, uh, you know, back, back to some level of normality, I guess. Um, and so as we go through this period of sort of the shutdown, I'm curious how the city will continue to support uh, sort of local leaders um, and local small businesses, actually, um, especially uh, when you know some of the some of the businesses are creating different opportunities to help people. So I think of, for example, the story about how uh, there was a restaurant called Little India that was serving up free meals to people who couldn't afford it. Um, and uh, so I wonder if there's other sort of like local leaders that are thinking of similar sort of problems uh, and challenges and trying to find ways to solve it. And could the city actually support them through this period to be able to deliver those services to to people that matter in their community um, so, so that uh, you know we can at least get through this together um, and not not necessarily sort of you know everyone is waiting for the next major government announcement kind of thing uh, we can solve we can problem solve and actually deal with the problems that we have right now on the ground today and then I guess the other thing I was and my question sort of for the future is actually to think about uh, kind of leadership from sort of a kind of a systemic um, perspective and that's really the idea that um, I mean leadership really is this idea of like how are we uh, actually making decisions and sort of managing all the issues and challenges um, and having enough inputs to be able to make um, these like really, really meaningful decisions that actually really impact people in the long term um, and actually have some some level of like um, really, really good outcomes out of it. Uh, and so I wonder, is there like an opportunity to use sort of this this moment to be able to actually start to redesign actually large systems? So things like housing, things like transportation, um, you know, these things that actually we knew weren't actually functioning in the most effective way, uh, even before this all happened. And we knew that they were leaving a lot of people out. We knew that, uh, you know, that um, systemically speaking, they weren't actually uh, delivering the outcomes that we wanted them to. So at what point do we, are we actually able to then use this moment to really start to redesign those systems from the ground up? Um, and uh, and I, I posit that, uh, I mean, I'm 
like a lot of my work actually also, I work with a lot of um, strategic foresight folks, uh, futurists, uh, designers. Um, and so there's a really strong community of those people in this city. And they're actually really willing and ready to help to really actually do this sort of work to think about like what are the future scenarios that we're looking at, where, where, we, where we could be more resilient, um, and actually doing sort of the, the heavy design work that's necessary to actually build these like human oriented systems that could actually take us into the future and be resilient for the next calamity that comes along. So I'll leave it there. Thank you, Howard. Thank you. Uh, and last but certainly not least is Amanda. Amanda, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. I'll be quick because I'm last. <laughs> I own the Workaround, which is a 13,000 square foot co-working space for parents with childcare by registered early childhood educators at Danforth and Woodbine. And I live six minutes away. Uh, my kids are five and three, and believe me, uh, it sucks to have built a solution for parents to work around their kids and then not be able to help my community right now. Um, it's been hard. The Workaround was built for entrepreneurs like me who heard calls from our city that Toronto loves entrepreneurs, that we need to do better to support women in tech, and that we love vibrant small business. So I answered the call and I took out a whole bunch of debt. To date, we have 749 unique members who've come through the workaround in less than two years. And I love my work. And sadly, my story of this crisis is not unique. The rising leaders in this community who are most often celebrated are tech leaders, political leaders, and corporate founders. But the leaders who will be most harmed in this crisis are brick and mortar owners who put their personal lives on the line for their dream. The way I feel, and the way so many other small business owners in my community is like a bomb went off and nobody can see the damage. We know that people are dying from COVID-19 and we did the right thing by closing before we were ordered to. I also know that our business and personal security is at risk. It doesn't feel like anyone really gets how grave the damage already is for me and others on the Danforth where the workaround is. Uh, I'm active in my local community. Many of us, as in hundreds of business owners in the East End of Toronto, are seriously considering personal bankruptcy. We've discussed walking away from our leases with all the consequences of that. We will lose our homes and destroy our credit. I'm worried about this right now. To put it plainly, Mayor Tory, I'm not sleeping. Uh, I lost my job when I closed my storefront. And I need advocates for brick and mortar businesses the way I've seen you advocate for entrepreneurs and startups globally. What the city can do is to put pressure on our provincial government to treat commercial evictions the same way as residential by pausing evictions so we have time to come up with a plan while we're closed. We need to waive property taxes for three months. We need to waive all principal, principal payments and interest on loans to ease up the pressure on landlords. And finally, what I need from you personally, Mayor Tory, is the advocacy for the community of small business owners, many of us who are in this for the first time. We desperately need non-debt support. So many of your rising leaders are in brick and mortar locations, and I truly believe will never lead again if they lose everything due to this public health emergency. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you for that. Uh, Mayor Tory, I'm going to turn the, the virtual microphone back to you for some reaction. Yeah, I'll just react a, a bit to it all. Uh, and I suppose in a way, Amanda's, there was a couple of that, that struck me as being particularly important. And, and I should say, by the way, one of my colleagues, Brad Bradford, the, the city councillor, who is an alumnus of this uh, program, uh, is on the line with us tonight. And I'm going to ask Brad to follow up because these things are fine in the sense they raise some very, very important issues. Uh, but if you don't follow up, it's just a thing where one more thing where I take notes. And I, I don't diminish that, but I just think if you have somebody like Brad who wants to follow up and we can engage uh, in a serious way more so than for an hour or so, that's important. Um, and, and, and a couple of it that strike me is I'll, I'll, I'll start with where we finished with Amanda. Um, I have been since the beginning of this, which is only, it seems like years, I think, but it's only been a few weeks. Uh, a, a relentless advocate for small business because I recognize the fact that people who've put their heart and soul and money uh, into these businesses need help right now. There are limits 
on what governments can do, uh, obviously. I mean, and, and I think the federal government has tried to do what we told them to do, those of us who are advocating as a result of listening to business, in that the first thing they did was to try and help people by putting some uh, money into their pocket through that emergency benefit. And I would say many of the people who spoke on the line tonight are people who may not think they qualify, but they do, uh, artists do. Uh, and they made special arrangements to make sure that people who were not in the employment insurance program, for example, qualified for this benefit, which will put $2,000 a month into people's pockets. And I realize $2,000 a month in Toronto doesn't go a long way, but it's certainly better than uh, not having anything, especially for people who wouldn't have qualified for employment insurance. Uh, they have put uh, together now this uh, $71 billion. So this is the thing where People say, well, it's not enough, and, and, and it may well not be. I was one of the loudest people to say to them in a very polite, constructive way, because it doesn't work to do anything else, that the 10% wage subsidy originally offered for a few months was just not going to cut it because business told me they needed something more like 75. The government moved up to do 75% of wages, uh, and uh, that is meant to help keep people employed, uh, keep people in the job so they don't have to become unemployed and look for a new job, which is quite a theme going through all this, is that we should be finding ways to give people new jobs. I guess the focus for right or for wrong, and when we get to the question period, you can comment, was to allow more people to keep their old jobs and allow more businesses to keep the current employees on the payroll as opposed to having to lay them all off for good, as it were. Um, and that may or may not have been the right thing to do. And again, uh, Amanda said something about how uh, these businesses need non-debt uh, money. Um, I think the government, again, uh, when, and I'm not their apologist by any means, but you have to look at their financial situation in the end and the degree to which you, in particular, the people I'm talking with tonight, are going to have to pay all this back in terms of a debt that's incurred uh, to save the economy. And, and they're trying to incur as much as they can to save the economy because that's not an overstatement as to what's needed. So the program they're doing for business, which allows uh, a loan in addition to the wage subsidy of, I think, 40000 or 50000 in total with 10000 forgivable, was meant to make part of it a grant, in effect but part of it had to be a loan repaid over a long period of time. And it was only meant to sort of give a degree of liquidity. So I, I think that a lot of these things are as much as the government can do at this time. I think you'll see them do some more, including things that will backstop landlords in the commercial sense, because a lot of the landlords are small uh, people who own one piece of property on the Danforth or somewhere. They have a mortgage on it. So if you say to them, we'll stop charging the rent to the tenant, they're going to have a problem. So I think the government is going to move fairly shortly, you'll see, to backstop some of those smaller landlords. So I think there's a lot of those very practical kinds of things going on, which apply to a number of the questions that were in comments that were made. I want to go to just one other. Um, I mean, I, I, I would love to be able to sit here and say that I'll be the most powerful advocate for a rent freeze. I just, I'm being really honest with you and saying I don't think that is necessarily going to be the prescription that we need right now, because what we're focused on is the people who've lost their job and can't pay their rent at all as opposed to all the other people who still have their jobs and may think their rent is too high, and they may be right. I'm in no position to comment on that. But uh, the people we're focused on are the people who can't maybe pay their rent at all and trying to put cash in their pocket so they can stay uh, in a place to live. And the rent freeze, uh, rent controls are on. I mean, I, all except new apartments, and they control rents. Uh, and there's some people who disagree with that, not me. But rent controls are on. Uh, and I just don't think the kind of thing like a rent freeze is something that's going to be practical and it's going to help, I guess, everybody in a certain way, but it's not really going to help those who need help the most. Uh, and I think that's what the governments are trying to do is help those who need help the most. The other one that I wanted to comment on um, is the one that uh, commented, the person that commented about the future of work and looking at some of these very big questions. And uh, there was a second one that spoke to the question of taking advantage of a crisis to change things. I think that this is where the Emerging Leaders Network and Civic Action have a huge role to play, helping us. And, and I'm going to invite Brad Bradford to be the person that is your contact on sitting down together and in an organized way, look at two or three of these issues. Look at what the impact will be on the world of work and on work as we know it. I mean, people have now discovered, I guess it's good news and bad news, that they can work from home. And there may be a lot of people and a lot of businesses. And, and this may be good or bad. The businesses may say, we can save a lot of money on rent on office buildings uh, by having people work from home. but that may sort of um, destroy or inhibit the social aspect of work, which is important for people to be together and form a team. And I think a lot of that kind of the future of work has to be discussed. What kinds of work will not be relevant any longer, not because uh, of COVID-19 per se, but because it was a moment in time that caused us to stop and focus on that kind of thing. Um, there were other things mentioned in that same regard uh, that um, I think relate to things like childcare, which kind of came up indirectly through a discussion of Amanda's business. And, you know, where is that now going to fit in, in in the context of some changes that have taken place that we've been forced to confront 
uh, by virtue of the of the uh, of the pandemic, which has caused us to work from home and have childcare closed and have all this kind of thing uh, go on. Uh, I, so I, I just think there's going to be a lot of uh, benefit to be derived if Civic Action Emerging Leaders Network would take on with Brad two or three of these things that look out a little further beyond the immediate, which is what we're concerned about now is to trying to save people from going bankrupt, save people from being out of their apartments, save people who are unemployed so they can hang on long enough for the economy to come back, which we're saying we hope will be in the summertime if we can fight this a pandemic appropriately. So I'll stop there. I, I didn't possibly answer all the different things that were said. We will continue and we're continuing more aggressively with our affordable housing program and talking about taking advantage of a crisis. We're going to see if we can build some modular housing for immediate use during the crisis that can then be turned into supportive housing. So this is an opportunity for us to kind of really re-examine how fast we did things. You saw the Chinese and even some people in North America building hospitals in weeks. Well, if they can do that, we're just as smart as all those people are. We can build some housing, modular housing, in a short period of time, use it during the crisis, and then use it for supportive housing for people who have special needs afterwards. So that's evidence of how we're trying to take advantage of the crisis to change the way we do things. So let's move to a pure q and I'm going to, I've been taking a lot of notes here. It just wasn't possible unless I used up all the time to answer everyone. <laughs> I'd rather now answer specific questions and say that I promise you that Brad and me, but Brad will help me. Uh, to follow up with you in an organized, structured way to look at two or three of these things that really, I think, would benefit immensely from your detailed discussion with us and maybe from uh, getting involved some of the people from the university sector and so on that Civic Action does so well. So I'll stop there. Mayor Tori, I'm, I'm happy to share that Brad is a well-trained member of our Diversity Fellows alumni who already reached out at lunchtime today about the possibility of doing something. So for sure, we're totally on board Thank to help you. with that. We're going to move into the Q and A portion. We have three people on the screen, and then we'll pull some from the chat. If we, we'll try to try to keep these as tight as we can, because I know and we're I'll getting keep the answers close tight to time. too. I'll try. <laughs> uh, we're going to start. Oh, we just lost Sahar. Uh, oh, those are those. So we're going to start with Sahar, and then we'll go to Brittany and Miriam. Sahar, over to you. Hi, thank you so much, Mayor Tori and Civic Action, and also to all of the people who have asked such thoughtful questions and shared their perspectives. My question is relating to social isolation and the impact that that will have on people in the long term. Um, so there is a direct research between social isolation and the impact that it has on an individual's health. Given that our healthcare is at full capacity and will be for the next foreseeable future, how is the city planning to support people who will be experiencing things like mental health issues, um, higher risk of premature death is one of the consequences of social isolation, and also recognizing that not everybody has access to technology to be socially connected, even when they're physically distanced. Uh, so this will be a significant policy issue, and just wondering what the city is planning to do to address that in the long term. Well, what we've done in the short term right away is to set up these 14 tables working with the United Way and I think many other community organizations. And one of the purposes of it is to ensure that people remain connected. And there's mundane, when I call it mundane, there's granular things like making sure seniors get food delivery who are asked to stay in. And the tables in each of the 14 parts of the city are looking after that through volunteer and agency help. But then they're also going to address themselves to um, means by which they can keep connected with people to try to make sure they identify early on uh, instances of social isolation that can lead to or, or, or exacerbate existing mental health conditions. Uh, so. Um, those, the, the, so they're doing things as basic as setting up in the good old fashioned way, especially with the clientele, they may be dealing with uh, telephone trees that actually sort of connect people through the city to each other in a very organized way. So people are getting these regular kind of outreach check-in calls uh, every day from somebody who's probably going to be a volunteer, but is going to be able to identify if they're talking to somebody who is seemingly much more troubled than they were yesterday. I was very gratified to see, to see today that the pr provincial government allocated some money specifically to uh, safeguard and watch over the mental health of people in the province. I'm hopeful the federal government will do the same. They've set aside between the two governments about $5 billion for mental health. Now is the time to invest some of that money in immediate um, resource availability for people who already were suffering from mental health or who are going to end up with some uh, sort of almost PTSD type problems from the social isolation. And I will be advocating for that in response to today's announcement because I think we need to do more. So I think there are some short-term measures community driven uh, and that's something, again, that the Emerging Leaders Network could get involved in if they wanted to, just in terms of this discussion going forward. Some government initiatives to put some resources into the hands of existing agencies that help deal with mental health, uh, which I think will allow them in the short term to keep their staff and to outreach to a, to a broader audience because there's certainly more people who are suffering the effects of this uh, crisis uh, today. 
Thank you, Sahar. Thank you. Uh, Brittany, over to you. Hi, Mary, Tor Mary Tori. Uh, thank you so much again for your time today. Uh, my question is about um, the people that are currently um, young and healthy leaders that are stepping up uh, to help vulnerable populations uh, run errands or with groceries. Um, has the city thought about supports for them uh, in terms of like reduced uh, parking um, or free parking, uh, TTC passes, gas coverage, that kind of thing? Um, because these are uh, added costs to this essential work that people are doing for their communities. Um, we have talked about it and I've had some requests, but here's the problem we've got very simply. Um, the TTC is losing $20 million a week uh, on revenue. And that doesn't sound like a lot of money, but multiply that times uh, uh, 50 weeks and you've got a billion dollars that it just dis vaporizes into thin air. Um, and we've been asked, for example, to consider free transit for everybody. We've been asked to consider free transit for healthcare workers. And the bottom line is that if we, if we offer it for free, uh, then that is coming away from, given the balanced budget legislation that we are live under, it's coming away from some other service we're providing to people. And so I guess we're having to do this kind of balancing exercise that sort of says, well, what is the relative value of rewarding, say, volunteers who step up to help others in the community, which we value, uh, and, and the cost of that, on whether it's on free parking, because we get that money, or free transit, versus that money being available to provide for a better care for the homeless, or to provide for more support that we're giving to food banks. And so I'm just being honest with you and saying this is the uh, sort of balancing act we have to go through every single day. Uh, what we're encouraging instead, I guess, of the government doing it is uh, some of the private sector donors who have come forward. And there have been quite a few uh, very privileged people who've come forward and said they want to donate a lot of money. I'll think of somebody like Gary Slate, who you probably saw donated, I think, $3 million of his own money to the food banks the other day, which was great. But I'm now encouraging them uh, to donate because I'm talking to several of them who've come forward to donate to a sort of stabilization fund that will give money uh, on a grant basis, preferably to social service organizations whose donations have dried up. And that might permit them to be in a position to take both their staff and some of their volunteers and help them even, as you say, with a free transit fare, which is not really that much money at the end of the day. So I'm conscious of the, and by the way, the government programs I referred to, the wage subsidy program and so on, do apply to the nonprofit sector. So a number of you on the line tonight who talked about your nonprofit organization struggling right now do qualify if you have a $50,000 payroll and have been around for a relatively short period to get the wage subsidy program, which I think should help you. But I'll, I, I, with Brad, I'll take that request away and see if there's some ways in which we can help. But I've just been honest with you in saying for every dollar we give away for that, as valuable as that is, it's a dollar we then don't have. Uh, and we could raise taxes, but I think it's going to be a bad time to raise taxes coming out of this uh, terrible low. And we could cut other services, but I don't think you want us to do that. I mean, the services we are providing today are all very much needed. So with this balanced budget thing, um, you know, which is, I think, a desirable thing in many ways most of the time, um, it's just hard for us to come up with that kind of money. Because you may say, well, how much is free transit going to cost for a group of volunteers? Well, the answer is, um, you know, it just gets added to the $20 million a week we're losing at the TTC. And that 20 million has to be made up to keep the buses running and keep paying the drivers. Mayor Tori, are you able to go another 10 minutes or so, or do you have a yep. hard stop? Yep, okay. no. Nope. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Brittany, for the great question. Um, Miriam, over to you. Hi, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Mayor Tori and for Civic Action um, and the team for facilitating uh, this event. My question really is about um, job security. Um, We've seen, particularly in the recession in 2008, um, the effect that had on a lot of young professionals, a lot of um, folks that were coming out of school, um, people that were just starting their careers, that, that, that strain and that effect that it had on them. And it wouldn't be too far to, to guess that something similar, of a, a recession of, of sorts, will pick up once the pandemic is over. Um, what can, kind of tools and strategies and resources can we put in place now um, for those young graduates that are graduating in the summer, for young professionals, for people that have been laid off um, due to the current situation, how can we help them get up to speed? What kind of resources can we provide to them once the pandemic, um, once it's subsided, or what can we provide to them um, right now and to support them in, in that journey? I am missing a call with the uh, other big city mayors from across Canada because I had agreed to do this and I actually thought this was just as important. Uh, one of the things they're discussing tonight is a post 
uh, pan pandemic uh, re recovery and stimulus and things that the governments can do, the city governments, but also they're talking with the federal minister uh, to stimulate economic activity afterwards. We are developing what I hope will be a very robust plan in the city uh, to kind of get business open again. And, and, and by saying get business open, it's focused on people too, because the whole idea is if business opens, people start patronizing businesses, they start back up again, they're going to create and preserve jobs that already exist or new jobs for people who are just coming out of a college. So I think we're all very focused. And, and again, I'll be very honest with you in saying we've been incredibly focused for the last three weeks on, you know, incredibly fast moving challenges that we have to take, uh, we have to deal with, like um, special shelters for the homeless, like providing for the seniors who are left on their own when we say to them, you can't come out of your homes, like uh, the impact that we've had on the senior population in long term care, where you see people dying. And really just trying to get people to behave the way that they should behave in order to stop the spread of this virus. We've been very focused on that. But we've begun very serious consideration of longer term plans that will, uh, and I will say to you, I had a session like this with a bunch of, a whole bunch of tech people. Their sense of optimism, and I know somebody earlier on said I pay too much attention or that I should pay more attention to other groups beyond them. They represent a lot of the answer to the question you just asked in terms of where the job creation was taking place. They're incredibly bullish because they said the last time we had a recession in 1998, 99, um, it was uh, at least 2008, 2009. It was a period of great creativity after that in terms of creation of new businesses, new ideas, taking advantage of the, uh, of the situation, the financial meltdown that happened at that time. So I will just tell you, we're very focused. Brad is part of a group that is gonna develop a robust plan for the city. The other governments are focused on starting to develop those plans, witness the conference call tonight with the federal minister and the big city mayors that I'm not on, but uh, I've got somebody on for me. But um, I think the whole idea of that is to make sure that when we get through, probably through the summer, I think it's going to be, the, the summer will be a time when we start to open up for business, I think, based on people making efforts. And then in the fall, we'll be able to see business turn back up. And I can tell you that in a lot of the businesses I've talked to, they're really just raring to go once this is over with. And there's a lot of pent up kind of um, entrepreneurialism and, uh, and, and good confident feeling about the success we were enjoying before this happened. And this didn't happen because of a financial meltdown, it happened because of a pandemic, which means there are underlying healthy business aspects that will resume uh, coming to the fore. So I know it doesn't precisely answer the question of how are we gonna create jobs for those grads. I just think if we have these plans in place that get things going again, robust plans that are financed uh, by all governments, uh, we'll be able to create the right environment and the private sector will create the job opportunities that were being created, as you know, in huge numbers before this happened. Thank you, Mayor Tori. There has been lots of chatter in the uh, in the chat box and in the Q&A box. And I just want to get to a couple of those. So um, so the people that are out there, um, these are the top ones that have been upvoted by the group. Uh, the first one is, what can be done to support families where both parents are frontline workers, especially when it comes to childcare and limiting spread of the virus? Well, we've done something that, as far as I know, is the only place in North America it's been done, or it was when it started, and that is that we have put in place 24-7 childcare, and we put it in place in a flexible way in terms of how much we had available to provide specifically for uh, childcare for frontline workers, and that included a broader definition than you might have thought. It started off in our mind being healthcare workers and expanded to other first responders and even to people that have proven to be very vital links in all of this, including people who worked in, uh, in, in some of the food supply industries and so on. Uh, the take-up has been solid. Um, and I think about 500 families have found uh, 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 this child care to be made available to them, but we made it flexible in the sense that we opened four centers initially. We've already decided, I think, that we have to open more because of the demand and because of the limitations of how many people can be in any one space under these pandemic rules. So I would just say that we have done that. We did that for people in the city of Toronto and workers in the city of Toronto. If there's ideas on how we could be doing more than that, uh, then and by the way, the province stepped up and helped to pay for that. So I should give them full marks for that because it was an idea we came up with and we presented it to them and they said they would pay. So I would say through the exercise with Brad, which we'll get going right after this, and my colleague, uh, Emily Hillstrom, who works in my office, uh, we will uh, sit down with you and figure out what the other needs are both during the crisis. And I think that may be one of the areas where we take a second look as part of the future of work and all that at childcare going forward, because you uh, are in the generation that are gonna be extremely focused on that in many cases. And we'd like to hear what's wrong and what's right about the current system. Okay, great. Um, there's another question that's asking, how is the city planning for long-term solutions to the systemic challenges that our marginalized populations are facing, which COVID-19 has exacerbated? And will immediately yeah, I mean, be carried sorry. forward? 
it, it, we had a, uh, a poverty reduction strategy that was, uh, you know, well underway. It had been in place for about three years and we were into sort of the second phase of it. And it included things like, and people sort of forget, you know, you put these things in and then people sort of say, what have you done recently? But we, for the first time in history, for example, created a low income fair pass for the TDC. Never been done before. Uh, we created uh, a substantially increased number of childcare subsidies and we're on track to uh, and continue to increase that, although the province then stepped in and made some changes. We're trying to convince them to reverse uh, in child care. And so we're still working at that. And I think we're making uh, some progress. Uh, we have a as big uh, an affordable housing push, including deeply affordable housing, as has ever been undertaken by the city before. The, what we have now with housing now and open doors is bigger than even when the St. Lawrence community was created. We have more uh, affordable housing units in the pipeline and under construction than at any time in decades. Uh, we now have a stable funding uh, base for, for 10 years for Toronto Community Housing in terms of commitment from the city government, first time ever, of $1.6 billion to affect the repairs properly, with some help from the federal government too on that, by the way, more than a billion dollars from them. So there's a lot of things we've done as part of the poverty reduction program, unprecedented expansion of the student nutrition program every year. And so I would just say to you that the fundamentals are there, the commitment to the poverty reduction strategy continues. Um, and we are doing things as well. First time ever the city's had an anti-black racism strategy. And you may say, what does that have to do with this? Well, the reference was to marginalized communities. There's a community through uh, anti-black racism that has been marginalized in a number of different ways. And we have tangible projects being undertaken pursuant to that strategy to try and help that community to uh, emerge out of that marginalization. So we're doing a lot. We've been interrupted in that by this uh, whole thing that we've had to deal with in the short term, but I can assure you that when we get back to business, uh, you know, to normal business, as it were, um, those are the things we're going to return to because they were huge priorities with the government that uh, I'm happy uh, to have the privilege of leading. Okay. Um, last question that I will ask you, and then we'll, we'll go to closing remarks. Um, with thousands of students graduating in these uncertain times, and the public sector seeing an increase in demand for urban services and programs, will the city continue its own hiring process? Well, we're going to continue. There's no thought of, uh, of a freeze or anything, but what we have to come to grips with in the short term, and again, I hate to keep saying we got to sort of worry about what's going on in the next two weeks. We presently have some uh, civic employees who uh, can't do their jobs uh, in the present circumstance, or at least as we've told them to stay home from City Hall and it's closed, they can't do their jobs. They have to be at City Hall or somewhere else they can't be. So we've got to sort of figure out a way, and frankly, and we're doing this right now, in which we can redeploy as many of those workers as possible. I regret to say there are going to be some seasonal workers that were supposed to be getting hired on by the city literally in the next few days to run some of the spring recreational programs. We're not going to be hiring them. We can't. I mean, we can't hire them and pay them to oversee programs that aren't being offered. Um, and we have to give refunds to all the people that paid to be in some of those programs. So I think at the moment, things are a bit uncertain in terms of being able to say to you that we're going to be doing any extra job creation or job programs. But I will say that the city, the nice thing about city government, and when I say nice, is that the water has to turn on every morning. Transit has to run. The police have to come. The fire department has to come. The parks have to be kept. The roads have to be kept. Snow has to be plowed. It goes on. There are things where, you know, in some case of some government services, if they didn't happen one day, maybe nobody would notice for a while. But in our case, it's very day-to-day -day services, child care, parks, and student nutrition programs, and so on. Those services will continue. If anything, they may be slightly uh, in more need uh, for, for those. So I'll just say to you that we have no plans. We, we, we're going to have a very difficult financial circumstance to uh, deal with because of the uh, 20 million bucks we're losing on transit. And, you know, we're losing a whole bunch of money every week. But uh, we're just going to have to deal with that. That's what we're sent to do. We will. And we will not do it, though, at the cost of services that especially vulnerable people need in a, a post uh, sort of traumatic environment that they're going to face when this is all over with. And can I just say one more thing? And, and do I get closing remarks? Because I would be very brief on it and not deal with any of this. I want to deal with something quite separate. We're going to move into that right. You okay. No, we're going to move into that right now. I just wanted to say um, there's a there's lots of of great questions and there's lots of chat in in the uh, in the chat box. We will. Can you print that off by chance? Can we turn it off? Print it off. Oh, print it off. Yeah, I was going to say we will collect it. We're going to document it all and we'll make sure that that gets with gets sent to your team and also Brad. Yeah. And we'll work Emily with them. And Brad both we'll would be great to, for, for them to have it. Yep. The only me the message I want to leave at the end of this is to thank you. And I'm sorry, you know, you never have enough time to deal with every question. And I give long answers. And I apologize. I try to be complete in telling you what's going on and uh, some of the challenges we're trying to meet at the moment. The most important thing, and there was the very first comment I think that was made in the 
chat at the beginning of the contributions that were being made was that maybe young people have been villainized. And if that's so, that's not fair, because I think the people that have been acting irresponsibly have been of all ages, and they are a minority, as usual. But I just need to say to you this, very, very simply and sincerely, when you see the projections tomorrow that are going to come out for the first time, you will be, you will be, I don't even know the right word. I mean, you, you will not find it comprehensible that in our city of Toronto that we're actually projecting the possibility of losing life on a scale like we're seeing in New York. And, and the thing is, though, because we're at an earlier stage in the entire evolution of this thing, we have a chance to make a difference and to save lives, to save lives, to save hundreds of lives, hundreds of lives of people who live in the city. And that doesn't involve actually anybody volunteering for anything. It involves people signing up to follow the rules. And I know most of you probably are because by definition, the kind of activists that we have on this call and involved with civic action would be people who, um, you know, who take that kind of stuff seriously. But your friends, your family, people who will just say, well, I'll just have a couple of people over for dinner. That's more or less following the rules. Or I'm just going to go out for a walk with three friends, even though I don't live with them. And that's okay if we all walk together down the sidewalk or just go out to the park for a little while and have a game of Frisbee, as somebody told me they saw happening outside of their building last night. Please pay attention to what the medical officer of health is telling you. It is a matter of life and death. This is not an exaggeration. This is, you've seen the devastating effects this has in places like Italy and Spain and New York City and other cities in the United States. We can do better than that here because we have the chance to do better now. And the reason we've locked everything down now is not because we wanted to hurt people or make their lives miserable or make them you know, stay cooped up in their condo or their apartment or wherever they happen to live for the next 12 weeks and hopefully it can be shorter but i'm being honest and saying it's likely to be 12 weeks the reason is because if we do that then we can substantially alter uh, the course of history in terms of the lives that are lost um, the damage that is not done to the healthcare system and the long-term uh, you know ability to get back in business and get back to a normal life as soon as possible it will make a difference of months as to how soon these restrictions come to an end if people start to follow those rules now if they follow the rules now, then the 12 week uh, turnaround to start to resume a normal life is conceivable. If we don't, then it's going to go a lot longer. And you just think about that prospect as sitting here at the end of the summer saying, well, when is the isolation going to end? I think we have a powerful motivator because we want to be out of this. We want people's lives to be saved. We want people to be healthy. We want the healthcare system to not collapse under the weight of all this. And we want to get back to our lives to follow the rules. And what you can do, if you're all doing it, tell your friends. Tell your family, tell them to take it seriously. This is not any kind of a matter that's, oh, it's just the flu. It's a deadly virus we don't know about. We don't have a cure. There's no vaccine. There's no serum. They're working on that, but they still don't have one. So please, if there's one message I can leave with you, it's to make sure you put the message out. This is serious business. That's why we put all these measures in place that restrict people's lives in this way. And that's, uh, it's for a reason. And we need your help to get the job done here and to get back to a normal life uh, where we can talk about the world of work being better and different. And we can talk about solving problems for marginalized communities and all those important things that, that go with being a successful, admired city. So thank you very much again. And I'm sorry for even the length of those remarks, but it's a very, very important message, I believe, from my heart, uh, sitting where I do and seeing what I see. Yeah, no, that's a, it's a very sobering, sobering remarks, but, but true. And I hope everyone on the line is, is actively following those. Um, I just want to reiterate to everyone in the chat, I know there's still lots of chatter, everything that has been shared will be collected and will be shared with the Meritorious team and, and so everything that's been shared will, will, get, will get, get shared. Um, to close things off, I want to bring back on Tamada, who will just say a final few remarks and then we will wrap up. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Meritori, and to everyone who's joined us tonight. I also want to just mention again that we had our two volunteer board chairs, Zabine and Tim, um, with us this evening. I believe they didn't appear on the screen at the start, and so the team is going to try to do that again. The gravity of this situation is, is so severe, and, and we heard that um, just now from the mayor, and we heard it from um, many of the questions and, and comments raised earlier today. We said at the beginning that this was about connection and community. And I'm gonna add a third word that begins with C today, and that's commitment. And, and what you're asking us is for a commitment to, uh, to follow the orders and to do the work. And what we uh, heard from our rising leaders today is a commitment to, uh, to, to the, the relief and recovery that's required. So, so you're right that the audience we had with us today is there. 
Um, and, uh, and on behalf of Civic Action and on behalf of the team who's worked uh, uh, hard with your team, Mayor Tory, uh, to put this on today, we're going to commit to keeping um, the lines of communication open, the cooperation, the coordination that we know uh, is, uh, is, is, uh, is going to be needed and is, is available through a network like the Emerging Leaders and so many more. So thank you again, everyone. Um, stay home, stay in touch, stay connected, and, uh, and have a good night. Thank you.